Father Michael O'Connor is a native of Ocean Springs, Mississippi, and the youngest of five children. He graduated from the University of Southern Mississippi in Hattiesburg, where he received his bachelor's degree in psychology and a minor in aerospace studies. Upon graduation, he was commissioned to work in the United States Air Force as a second lieutenant. Father O'Connor worked full-time for the Mississippi Air National Guard from 1990 until he answered the call to enter the seminary in 2000. He attended Notre Dame Seminary in New Orleans, Louisiana, and was ordained a priest of the Lord Jesus Christ on June 11, 2005. Father Mike also serves as spiritual director for the Curcio Movement of South Mississippi as a member of the Diaconate Formation Board, Boy Scout Chaplain, and he is on the Bishop's Presbyteral Council. Here is Father Mike. I've been asked at least 500 times, why do you want to be a priest? Or when did you know you wanted to be a priest? And there's a short answer to that question or those questions. I want to be a priest because I feel like God has called me to be a priest. I want to be a priest for the love of God and for the love of my neighbor. That's the short answer. There's a longer answer, and I have to kind of go back a little bit to give a good answer to the question. Once upon a time, I felt sorry for myself. Why did I feel sorry for myself? Two principal reasons. First of all, I had established for myself a career plan where I would be in five years, 10 years, 15 years, even 20 years, and things didn't work out. And the second reason was I had met a beautiful young lady, I'd fallen in love with her, and she fell in love with me, and our relationship unfolded and flowered, and then it began to fade, and we broke up. I had a broken heart, and I was disappointed in where I was in my career, and I felt sorry for myself. So at 26 or 27 years old, with a broken heart and this disappointment, I embarked on a journey of self-knowledge. In this journey of self-knowledge, I began to read a little more seriously, began to pray a little bit more than I had, and I discovered a couple of things. One of the first things I discovered was life is difficult. I had always kind of thought my life is difficult, but I discovered not my life is difficult, Life is difficult. Another thing that I discovered was on a trip to South America, in my job with the military, as I was a captain in the Air Force, the Air National Guard at this time, I was deployed to South America as a part of George Bush, number one, his war on drugs in the early 90s. And I found myself down there with my broken heart, my disappointment, feeling a little bit sorry for myself. You know, when we deployed, we brought a little bit of America with us. We had hot and cold running water. We had showers. We had good food. We had air conditioning. We had comfortable beds. We even set up our little tiki bar. But one thing that we didn't have was we didn't have flush toilets. We had outhouses, and we used to have to go use the bathroom in these biohazard bags. We would do our business and then put a little tape around the bag and take it and throw it on our trash pile to be burned every so often. And as I'm feeling sorry for myself standing there in South America, looking at the trash pile, I realize there's human beings digging in my trash pile. Now, I had throughout my life in the military, in the few years that I had been in the military, seen poor people, very poor people at times. But this day, it was different. As God had brought me through this disappointment and this broken heart to a place of searching for self-knowledge, I stood and looked at that trash pile, watching human beings dig through literally my crap. And it's hard to feel sorry for yourself when you see that. That was a moment of grace for me. I looked at my life and my difficulties in a new way. I realized how richly I had been blessed. I had a newfound awareness of my blessings. And this brought me to a place at about 27 years old where I think for the first time I ever prayed a deep, serious prayer of thanksgiving being grateful to God for all of the many things in my life. I had always had a sense that there was something wrong with the world. 
Now in this moment of grace, I realize there was something wrong with me. That God had brought me to this place and he had opened my eyes and I began my journey of conversion. I realized that I had been ungrateful, that I had begun to live my life according to the morality of the world, not the teachings of Christ and his church. And this began my conversion and my real journey to the priesthood. Now, I got home from that deployment, and I went to church, and I can't say that it was like all of a sudden I never felt sorry for myself again or never had a blue day, and I went to church, and I was going to church as a chore, but I was going anyway. And as I was walking out of church, a priest, Father George Kitchen, saw me as I was walking out, and he grabbed me. He said, son, you look like you're feeling down. And I was feeling down. I said, you're right, I am feeling down. And he said, would you like to talk? Now, I can tell you, at 27 years old at this point, I can't remember the last time I had talked to a priest. I couldn't remember the last time I had gone to confession. It had been a long, long time. I don't know if I had ever sat down and really had a good conversation with a priest. As we spoke, and as I kind of opened my heart to Father Kitchen, he asked me, and I was very candid with him, and I was very honest about where I had been and what I had done and what my life was like. And he said, son, would you like to make a confession of this conversation that we've had? You've already kind of told me everything. And I said, well, you know, Father, I don't think I can make a confession out of this conversation because I, I'm not sure I'm not going to go all do all of those things again. I can't tell you that I'm not planning to do all of those things again. And he said to me something I'll never forget. He said, Mike, you don't have to tell me you're never going to do any of those things again. What you have to ask, what you have to tell me is that you will call on the Holy Spirit to lead you in your life, the place you are supposed to go. And I thought, that's all I have to do. And he said, that's all you have to do. And so I agreed that I could do that. Um, you know what I learned, though? I learned that after you call on the Holy Spirit, really, from a deep place in your heart, he comes around sometimes when you're not asking him to come. <laughs> comes around to tap you on the shoulder and says, what are you doing, you know? Now, I had prayed a lot in a very selfish way in my life. God, this is what you can do for me. Anybody ever, ever prayed like that? God, this is my list of demands. Hurry up. And one of my demands had been to be uh, a good husband and to have a good wife and a good family. I wanted to be a good father. I can remember from my youth wanting to be a good father. And I remember praying one day, Lord, I have seen the errors of my ways. I have grown. You know, I used to think that I was ready to get married. I used to think I was ready to set, settle down. But now I recognize that I wasn't nearly mature enough. Now, you, the sooner you get me a good wife, the better. Let's get on with this. Now that I've grown and I'm mature. Now, this is a true story. As I was thinking that very thought, I have grown, I have matured, I have come to this place. I didn't see a flash of light. Didn't see a burning bush. But it seemed that I heard in my heart, Michael, I want you to be a priest. And I said, no. I was alone in my house, and I said out loud, no, aren't you listening? You got the wrong guy. I never had a sense that I had been called to be a priest before. If I would have known the scriptures well enough, I would have said, with Moses, I can't speak well. With Jeremiah, I'm too young. With Isaiah, I'm a man of unclean lips. With St. Peter, get away from me, I'm a sinner. No, I said, no, aren't you listening? I don't want to be a priest. And I went on to tell God all of the things that he could do for me. Now, this sudden sense that I was called to be a priest happened when I was 29 years old. And my vision of the priesthood at 29 years old was not a happy one, a not a fulfilled life. No sex, no kids, no family, no money, no way. I didn't want to be a priest. I didn't see anything attractive about it. I, I, I really thought, oh, what am I going crazy and then I had another thought. If God has sunk down to calling me to be a priest, things are 
are awful. I mean, they're, they're, things are, are really, really bad. I'm the bottom of the barrel. I'm third string. There's no way. While I go to church, I really don't enjoy going to church. And in a sense, this call had come out of nowhere. I had no interest in it. I had never been an altar boy. I'd, I never was in CYO. Nothing. An hour, in and out, that's it. My life, like so many others, was very much caught up in the post-Christian modern American culture. John Paul II described it as a culture of death. And I suppose at its worst, that is what it is. But even at its best, it is not a culture that urges people to make of themselves a living sacrifice. These are the words that St. Paul uses to describe a follower of Jesus Christ. And when I heard at the age of 29 the call to be a priest, I knew instinctively that is exactly what I was called to do, is make of myself a living sacrifice. And so I said no, and I meant it. On the other hand, events in my life before this sudden revelation had been moving me closer to God and to his church. Aided by hindsight, I had, began to, I had begun to suspect that God had been calling me for some time, but I never had the capacity to hear him. The prayer of Eli in 1 Samuel, Speak, Lord, your servant is listening, was never my prayer. My prayer was, Listen, Lord, I'm speaking. The process of me moving closer to God included a growing awareness that there's something wrong with the world. That very awareness that I had been had since I was a little kid, that very awareness that I had in that psychology class when I was in college, that there's something wrong with the world, fundamentally wrong. This awareness helped me see my own sinfulness in a new life, that there's something wrong with me. There's something wrong with me. You know, like a team without a coach, like a family without a father. Jesus looked inside and said, they're like sheep without a shepherd. That gradual change in me, as I mentioned, accelerated a little bit by uh, South America and some other things. With that thankfulness that I experienced and my blessedness that I experienced, I felt that call to a radical and sacrificial calling to follow Jesus Christ. And in that moment, I was tempted literally to just turn and run. It was too much. It seemed like too much. But I couldn't quit, you see. My eyes of my relationship had been opened with Jesus. But I wanted to control. I wanted to limit God's role in my life. And I threatened to abandon God. Because I was still in love with my plan, my goal, my wants, my desires. And I resolved myself to outlast God's call. You can go back now to that conversation I was having God telling him how I was mature enough to get married. Now I was mature enough to give my life away. Well, I could see that wasn't necessarily true. But you know, this only affected me, didn't it? This was my call to be a priest. I'm telling you, I was not in the habit of watching EWTN on television. I was flipping the channels one day, and I watched this little segment, just a little minute of it. And there was a call-in. And the call-in question was, my uncle died in the very act of committing adultery. You know, what's the state of his soul? And the commentator says, essentially, that's not good. That's not good at all. To die in the very act of committing adultery, that's a mortal sin. That's a deadly sin. That Condemned to hell, you know. He went on to say, I can't judge their soul, but that's no way to die. And as I was listening to that program, and I thought, immortal sin, adultery, I'm going to hell. All of my friends are going to hell. Everybody I know is going to hell. There's something wrong with the world. And I felt this call t to be a priest, right? I felt this call to be a shepherd. I felt this call to be a father. But I said no. What did Jesus really want? Who is he? 
How does he interact with the world? What does he expect of me and why? My journey to get to know Jesus and get to know his call for me was really just beginning to unfold, but I was getting uncomfortable with it, as I think I've made clear. This was my life, my spirituality, this much and no more. I want to stay in my comfort zone. It became difficult to pray. But I did continue to pray. I didn't abandon God. I kept reading. And I found myself reading St. Augustine. And as I was reading St. Augustine, I came across a passage that St. Augustine had said. Now, St. Augustine had become a priest in his life. And through his journey of life, he wrote this idea that he had begun to go insane on his way to sanity. And that is exactly the way I felt. As all of the things that were important to me in life started to lose their importance, and as my relationship to God started to grow more and more important, and I started thinking, you know, I think I really do think I'm losing my mind. And uh, I wanted to run away, as I said. But the hooks of God, God's, you know, grace had begun to kind of draw me in. After I heard that call, a few things, and I understand I was 29 years old. I didn't enter the seminary until I was 35. So I had six years, okay, that all of these things, the next ones I'm going to tell you about. So don't think it was like every day something was happening, okay? But I had said no. I had determined I was going to outlast God. I started thinking I was going crazy on my way to sanity. And then one day I'm at Mass, kind of going through the motions, right? And I'm going through the motions at Mass. I'm not much of a singer, but they were singing, so I picked up the book, and I was following along, mumbling along. And the song was, Is it I, Lord? I hear you calling in the night. If you call me, I will follow. If you lead, I will follow. And as I was mumbling along with that, I closed the book and said, I will not follow and put it back. I said, I'm not going to stand here and lie to you on top of the fact that I'm saying no. And uh, I think at that point, kind of my heart was hard. And it began to occur to me that so much of what was being said and prayed and sung at Mass just was going completely over my head. One day, uh, again, sometime later, I was praying You know, God, this is what I want, right? I surely hadn't changed my habit of prayer yet. This is what you can do for me. Give it to him my litany of things. Bless my plans. I want it to work out this way. And then I heard a voice, kind of like the voice, Michael, I want you to be a priest. And it wasn't a particularly comforting voice. (laughs) Rather, it was kind of impatient, irritated, astounded. And that voice said to me, Michael, I know what you want. Pray the way I taught you to pray. And in that moment, understanding was flooded into me. Pray the way I taught you to pray. And I knew immediately that he was asking me to pray that God's will be done. That God knew me better than I knew myself. That God knew what would make me happier more than I knew what would make me happy. That God knew the plans and the destiny that he had for me. And that it was for me to figure that out, not for me to keep telling him what I want all the time. And so I got on my knees right then and there, and I think maybe for the first time I ever prayed, Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. My kingdom come, what? Thy will be done. And I meant it. Thy will be done. Shortly thereafter, it wasn't much longer, just a few nights later, I lie in bed. I have this idea that, you know, I mean, I'm I'm going crazy. (laughs) Maybe I'm supposed to be a priest. I don't know what to do, you know. I'm thinking about, uh, you know, I want to get married. I want to have a family, you know. I've been in love. I want to be in love again, you know. And I lay there in bed, and I hear a voice that says to me, speaks to my heart and says, Michael, do you trust me? And I said, no, I don't trust you. Look at the world. There's something wrong with this world. 
Look at all of the prayers that I've prayed, all of the people that I know that have prayed so much, all of the problems. I, I No, I don't. I don't trust you. I trust me. I know what it's going to take to make me happy. I trust me. And as I lay there <laughs> having this dialogue with God, a little tear dripping from my eye, I remember this well. I heard the voice very tender this time, very uh, loving, consoling. Just don't abandon me, and I will teach you to trust me. I saw with renewed clarity that I wanted to be in control, that my prayers were about God serving me. I didn't want to know God. I wanted him to do my will. This made me aware of the sin of omission, really for the first time. It was another day of grace, another day of change, and I knew I needed to get right with God. Okay. It was then I said, okay, God, if you really want me to be a priest, if you really want me to be a priest, you lead, you make it clear, and I will follow. I wish I could say that during all this time that my behavior had really changed, that I had really begun to live a life, you know, of a follower of Christ and a disciple of Christ, but I, I hadn't. And I remember going to Mass one Sunday. And I usually always sat on the left-hand side about halfway up. And this time, for whatever reason, I sat on the right-hand side all the way in the back. And when communion time came, right, I got up to go to communion, knowing that I wasn't where I needed to be, knowing that I had the sin of omission, knowing that I had all the sins of commission. And I got up and I'm going up to receive communion. That was what I did, you know. And it was as if all of the angels and saints were surrounding me, you know. It was like I was walking through this gauntlet, okay, and they all knew my call, and they knew my no. And I was just going forward, aware of this, knowing I had no business for the first time really dawned on me I had no business to receive communion. Well, I received communion anyway. And uh, that wasn't the right thing to do. But that day started a pattern of going to confession a little more regularly. And really the first time confessing a sin of omission that I didn't feel like I was following God's call. Well, shortly thereafter... After that, do you trust me? And after that, pray the way I taught you to pray. Starting to go to confession. Sitting in the pew when I wasn't ready to receive Holy Communion. And going and getting communion when I was able to get communion. I had more or less decided, okay, I'll go. I'll go to the seminary. I'll get this question behind me. I still think I'm going crazy. But at least let me go and settle the question of whether I'm crazy or not. All right? So... Remember, I worked for the National Guard, right? I worked full-time for the National Guard. I had told my boss. I had talked to Father Dennis. I got all my letters of recommendation. And I uh, was ready to go to the seminary. About the time comes, I was thinking about when am I going to quit my job? What am I going to do? What happens? I don't know if you all remember the Kosovo crisis, but the Kosovo crisis erupted, okay? And my National Guard unit got called to active duty. And it was like Christmas Day, as far as I was concerned. I was the happiest person that you could ever meet. I was so happy. I was thinking, I'm not supposed to be a priest. I'm going to Kuwait. I'm going to Kosovo. I'm not going to the seminary. And I was thrilled. I really was thrilled. I, I just, it was like a million pounds lifted off my shoulders. Like now I got my answer. And uh, I called Father Dennis and said, I'm not going to the seminary. Off I went. Off how we got, not to Kosovo, we got ended up getting deployed to Kuwait. There I was in Kuwait, and it happened that in Kuwait, they had a Catholic chaplain. They had a Catholic chapel, and I could go to daily mass if I wanted to, and I did. And I felt really free from this weight of this kind of impending decision that I had decided to go, and God made it clear that he didn't want me to go. So I was in Kuwait, which was fine. But I read... And I was tired of praying about whether or not I should be a priest. Tired of praying about it. Tired of worried about it. So I felt this instinctive call to fast. I don't think I had ever really fasted in my life, but I began to fast. And this fasting, 
I think, uh, began to uh, open me up a little bit more to whatever God's plan might be for me. Now, the deployment ended. I got home. I talked to Father Dennis. He called me. I said, no, Father, I'm not going to the seminary. You know, I'm going back to work. I'm just, you know, I'm putting it. No, for a while. All right. He said, Mike, will you do me this favor? Why don't you go on this retreat? Okay. And I said, okay, I'll go on a retreat. Well, I didn't know what I was getting into. The only thing he said to me was, just promise me you won't leave before it's over. And I said, okay, I promise I won't leave before it's over. Well, it's a 10-day silent retreat. Okay. (laughs) Now, he said it was only eight days, but the day you got there, the day you left didn't count. It was 10 days as far as I was concerned. So I get there with this promise that I won't leave. And I'll tell you, it's not easy. I was by myself. The only contact I had with anybody was mass and a half hour spiritual direction a day. Otherwise, it was silence. I was by myself. I had one question. Okay, I was back to the question, am I supposed to be a priest or not? I had one question that I wanted answered on that retreat. Well, at the end of 10 days, was that question answered? At the end of those 10 days, what I learned was this, and I learned it in such a powerful and beautiful way, that God had spoken to me, had communicated to me this truth. I don't want to take anything from you. I want to give to you. And this brought me to the Garden of Eden and Adam and Eve and the first temptation. And what was that? God's keeping something good from you. And I knew so clearly that I had fallen for that very same temptation. That God is out to get me. That God is keeping something good from me. You know, and then there's the second part of the temptation. Surely you won't die. Surely you won't die. Nobody will die. Don't worry. And this truth came to me that God doesn't want to take anything from me. And it put me at such ease. Now, I wasn't sure I wanted to be a priest. I wasn't even sure still that I was called to be a priest. But it opened me up to the reality that God didn't want to take anything from me. If I was supposed to be a priest, that's what was good for me. And so with that idea, I went to the seminary. I went to the seminary. And my first day in the seminary, there was a sign-up sheet for people to go interview. And as I went to interview, I learned that I wasn't supposed to sign up for this interview. These weren't brand new student interviews. These were returning student interviews from summer assignments. But the priest says, well, you're here. Let's talk. So he says, why do you want to be a priest? And I said, I don't think I do want to be a priest. (laughs) But I think God wants me to be a priest. And he said something to me that um, comforted me. At that place, it was exactly what I needed to hear. He said, you know, young man, if you don't get to the place in the next few years where you really want to be a priest, you have the responsibility to leave. And it was like, wow, you know. And I was so freed by that conversation. And I so appreciated it. Now, many times in this struggle, even as I began to be convinced that the call was not my imagination or I wasn't going crazy, I would still ask God to take this burden away from me and let me be happy in my own way. And then in a moment of clarity while praying before the Blessed Sacrament and asking God permission to do my thing, I felt as if God said to me, Michael, the priesthood is my gift to you. You don't have to accept it. But it is what is best for you, your happiness, and for others. I'm not sure in that moment, my first year in the seminary, if I was really comforted by those words. But I had begun to trust God. And more and more I believed that He would sustain me and give me joy and give me everything that I needed if I was honest with Him and faithful to His commandments. So my time in the seminary unfolds. Not long after I was there, uh, I think it was my second year, a major event happened in our country, and that was 9-11. Okay, now, 
I had been in the National Guard all of these years, and when I went to the seminary, it really was this kind of, I'm going to go do this, and I'll be right back, okay? <laughs> and so I got special permission to keep my affiliation with the National Guard one weekend a month. Well, 9-11 came, and we were a radar unit, and uh, we were called to active duty immediately. And as the Twin Towers were burning, I didn't know we were called yet, but I knew it was coming. I was in the chapel, and I remember I just kind of began to weep. And I was weeping over, there's something wrong with this world. And guns and bullets aren't going to fix it. That's not my war. I know God. This is my war. I don't want to fight that war. I, was, I, I loved my time in the military. I enjoyed all of my deployments. But I knew that wasn't my war. And I had, here I was, all of that time, you know, trying to get out of going to the seminary. And here I am, the irony of it, kneeling there in the chapel thinking I'm going to get pulled out. And I began to pray that I wouldn't. And I began to really get this tremendous sense of my vocation and my call to, to be a father, to be a shepherd, that there's something wrong with the world. And Jesus Christ is the key to heal a broken world. So there I was, and kind of a strange twist of things. And then just a few months later, and, and I cannot express to you all the depth of the swing, okay? A few months later, every single day, for months and months and months on end, on the front page of the paper, above the fold in New Orleans, Sex abuse scandal, sex abuse scandal, sex abuse scandal, sex abuse scandal. I was so ready to leave. I was so disappointed. I was so disheartened. Maybe I was a little bit naive in my life. I don't know. But it was just this tremendous sense of disappointment. And the morale in the whole seminary was kind of undermined. And just, you know, where am I? What's going on? How does this jive with this whole reality or idea of the priesthood that's growing in my life? So I wanted to leave. And I was tempted to leave. And I remember being in my dorm there at the seminary upstairs praying. And really praying with this question, you know, should I just, you know, I mean, at this point, uh, the National Guard, everybody's a hero. It's American flags everywhere. It's, you know, I can step out of this cesspool that I felt like I was in and to be a hero, you know. I felt that voice again, right? And the question this time was, Michael, will you abandon me too? It was really like... You're called to be a holy priest, a happy priest, to make your life a living sacrifice for others. And, you know, I had grown. I had grown. I had changed. I had deepened. I had developed. I, you know, and I'm not saying I was a saint by any means, but I had come to this place in my life where I felt like I had been given this gift of freedom, a freedom in some respects that I didn't know existed. A freedom in chastity that I didn't know existed. The world is so caught up in the lie that there's something so deeply wrong with the world. And here, you know, this gift had been given to me and I thought and I really looked down my nose in a judgmental way at all of the people that had failed the priesthood with something that bordered on Maybe hatred even. That was my attitude for a little while. And then the seminary continues. And one day I'm on summer break, getting ready to go on my summer assignment. And I'm running down the road. And I hear this voice, Michael, Michael. And I turn around and it's an old girlfriend. Okay, We talk, chit-chat, whatever. And then I have to go. You know, and I'm leaving town. I'm going away for an assignment. Well... She says, why don't we go to lunch tomorrow or something? I says, no, I didn't. You know, I'm in town a little bit longer. I didn't call her. I said I would. And then the next day, you know, I'm out running again, and I, she almost runs me over. Okay. So we stop, and she says, well, let's go to lunch. And we went to lunch, and it was good. It was very good. Okay. It was a kind of a wonderful kind of 
to go back to remember, rekindle. You know, this was a, a very nice thing. But, you know, I was committed to being a priest, a holy priest, a happy priest. And off I went to my summer assignment and really tried not to think too much about it. But then, you know, phone call, letter, this, that, and it was just beginning to be a distraction. And I thought, well, I'm grounded. I'm good. I've got this covered. God has brought me to a place where uh, I don't need to worry, you know. I wish that were true, you know. But I felt my heart begin to divide, okay. I felt myself really being drawn in a powerful way and very confused about where I was and what I was going to do. And I lay in bed and I think to myself, you said trust you. <laughs> this is what I was talking about. This is not where I want to be. This isn't the kind of emotional turmoil, emptiness that I'm beginning to feel. I began my last year in the seminary with this divided heart, journeying toward my ordination. And it was a real struggle. I have to say I had never seen the life of a priest as a romantic thing. I had always seen it as a sacrifice and a struggle. Always. Even when I began to see that it would be a life of joy. Even when I began to really trust God. But as this kind of distraction was in my life now, and I really was beginning to suffer, I remember uh, at Mass, Eucharist being held up. And I remembered my call to the priesthood. And it was as if I heard the voices of the world saying to me, come down off that cross. Come down off that cross. You don't have to go through all that. You don't have to give up this. You don't have to give up that. You can have it all. Come down off that cross. And I remember feeling this tremendous kind of unity with Christ. The priesthood is make of yourselves a living sacrifice. And let Jesus fill you. I was regrounded in that truth and could make my way through the remainder of my time there. I'm happy to say that I'm uh, striving to be a happy priest, striving to be a holy priest, recognizing that this truly has been a gift that God wanted to give me and a life of joy. Now, my whole talk here, I've been asked a million times, why are you a priest? Why are you a priest? Why do you want to be a priest? And I hope I've answered that question to some degree here. Why do I want to be a priest? Something's wrong with the world. Something's wrong with me. God is love. God loves the world. Jesus Christ has rescued me from the disease of sin, which is what's wrong with the world. And he has asked me to join him on that mission. He has asked me to be an icon of Christ, of himself. Unworthy as I am, he has asked me to be an instrument of his peace. And I can tell you right now, if I had a thousand lives to live, I would be a priest in every one of them. I truly believe that what the world needs more than it needs anything is men dedicated in a radical way to follow Jesus Christ. I am unworthy of this gift. Now, God knows the world needs priests, but God knows the world needs men and women to follow him in every vocation. And I guess people that will listen to my talk, not all of them, they all have a vocation. Not many of them will have a vocation to the priesthood. Maybe some of them will. Maybe some of them hopefully will be a little motivated by this. But everybody has a vocation, a calling from God. Even Jake and Elwood Blues had a mission from God, right? We all do, and that is holiness. The question is, how do we live holiness? Every vocation has a price to pay. Pay it. Every vocation has a life to live. Live it. Every vocation has risks. And to the degree that we are afraid to take the risks in our vocation, that is the degree to which we will not be happy. Everybody is called to make of yourselves a living sacrifice. Jesus is the icon of love for the world. Now, which vocation is more difficult? The vocation to married life to truly live married life the way the church calls us to live married life, open to life, 
to truly live married life as a vocation of laying down your life for the love of God. You know what St. Paul says? St. Paul says to his, the people in Corinth, I would spare you that trouble. And essentially says that celibacy is easier. And you know what? As a priest, after a few years of having the people coming in and out of my office all the time, I'm starting to believe it, you know? I'm starting to believe it. Men and women, you're called to give yourself away. And the problem with the world today, the problem, my problem, you know, and I'm not pointing fingers at anybody. The problem is that you have to possess yourself in order to give yourself away. And see, what's fundamentally wrong with the world is so many people are possessed by other things. They're possessed by the flesh. They're possessed by things outside of themselves. And they're incapable of giving themselves away because they don't possess themselves. In my weakness, I become strong. You see, my last year in the seminary humbled me to the point, I can't tell you how humble I was, how arrogant I was, how looking down my nose at everybody that ever failed, and then to let God's hand of grace back away from me just a little bit and watch how I collapse like a cheap suit. I've been called to be a priest, a holy, happy priest. I've shared my journey to the priesthood with you. Everybody has a vocation. Unfortunately, we live in a culture of death. But Jesus Christ calls us to the way and the truth and the life. How did his family react? Well, you know, one of the things, another part of the story that I left out a little bit was that when I felt called to be a priest and thought I was going crazy, I didn't tell anybody <laughs> for fear that they would think I was going crazy too. <laughs> Because they would have thought I was going crazy. The first time I, I ever told anybody, I said to my mom, after about two years, I said, Mom, I feel like God has called me to be a priest, but I don't want to be a priest. Don't be praying that I become a priest. Don't tell, your, don't tell my aunts and uncles to pray that I might become a priest. And she was just shocked. She said, I would have never thought, you know, where's that coming from, you know? And... Uh, but I, I told her to keep it a secret because I did. But I, I just wanted to prepare her in case I actually did go crazy that uh, she wouldn't think that I just did it like that. OK, well, it ended up being four more years before I went to the seminary. And I did tell a couple of people along the way. And during that time period between being called to be a priest and actually going to the seminary, I had a girlfriend for four years, the same girl on and off. And I, I knew in my deepest part of my heart, this wasn't it. But I also knew, on the other hand, man, if we break up, it's like Seminary City, you know? And, it's like, <laughs> <laughs> and so I was, it was a secret that I didn't tell people just because I was really waiting for it to go away. So their reaction was, in the beginning, there was no reaction. By the time I ended up really going to the seminary, their reaction, my friends, you know, some of them really did think I went crazy, really. They're like, what's, you know, what's gotten into you? And, and, but, but others weren't surprised, you know. The first time I ever really told a peer group, I was deployed to Italy on the Adriatic Sea. This was during the Kosovo thing. So I told them, I told this group of people, they were not my coworkers. I was with a company from, uh, it was actually a squadron from Missouri that I had known on and off over the years. And I said, you know, I'm thinking about going to the seminary. And one of the guys looks at me and says, hmm, that makes perfect sense or something to that effect. And I said, where do you get off saying that? You know, what, what are you talking about? Probably because I was the only guy going to Mass. And I would walk, you know, like two miles to get to Mass. Even though it was a chore, I knew I needed to go. And Mass has become a joy for me. I mean, truly, there was a, there was a transition where Mass became a joy. My spiritual life became more intimate with Christ was when I started going to daily Mass. And it was totally different, you know, a totally different experience. Father Mike, I have a question, and it's leaving this area and going yeah. further. Have you continued to have the voice guide you? You know, I, I have. Um, not as much. And I, and I think that I said earlier in the beginning, you know, like sheep without a shepherd, and that Christ has used people, priests, friends, to shepherd me. You know, one time... Shortly after I got to my assignment at Sacred Heart, I was a little bit exasperated. And uh, 
I heard that sense Jesus said to me, I know exactly what you're going through. Do you still struggle with the temptations of the world, even being a priest? My last year in the seminary has taught me absolutely I do still struggle. They're not as active. They're not as on the surface as they might be. There's a discipline in our lives that's required. And I think if I am disciplined in my prayer, I'm disciplined in my sleep, I'm disciplined in my recreation, I'm disciplined in who I talk to, when I talk to them, all of those things, then I think that those uh, challenges are very manageable. Those temptations and trials are, are part of life, yes, but not in the sense of being burdened by them all the time. I think I could be. I could kind of let myself go. I, and that's the beauty of that last year in the seminary. It really is. I look back on that as the day that God said, watch yourself. And he didn't say it in a day. He said it over a year. And I'll tell you, it was not an easy year. I mean, and I'm telling you, you're, if this, I was this close to leaving. And I'm holding my fingers a millimeter apart. I was so close to leaving. And I was already ordained a deacon. I was just tied up in a knot, you know. Divided heart, miserable. And that even continued into my priesthood a little bit. I would tell people to pray for me. They had no idea what was going on. I'd just say, pray for me. And I still say it, pray for me. I don't want to go back there. I don't want a divided heart. But I know, you know, standing here before you, I know that the trials and temptations that we're going to face with this whole Obama, the whole HHS, the whole, the Catholic Church, if we authentically live our faith, the trials and temptations are not necessarily going to be of the world in the way that they were then. They're just going to be to shut up, put up, get along. What advice would you give to any man feeling called to the priesthood? To pray. To work on purity of mind, heart, body, spirit. Go to confession. Get a spiritual director. And be open. That if God has called you to be a priest, this is kind of the, this is the ultimate point at which I really gave myself to the priesthood there in the first year. This is my gift to you. That God wants us to be happy. If our call is to the priesthood, it's a call to joy. Now, will there be suffering? Of course. May there be persecution? Yes. Might there be loneliness? Yes. Might there be hunger and beheadings? Yes. <laughs> there might be. But if that's what God is calling us to, our God is good. He does want us to have joy and happiness. So if a young man feels called to be a priest, just say, you know, speak, Lord, your servant is listening. You know, get into spiritual direction, go to confession, because there are some people I think who may be called, think they're called to be a priest, and they're not. Well, I have a follow-up to Matt's question. Father, if someone hears you say spiritual director, you know, they may not understand the voice you're asking them to seek. Yeah. So can you give a little guidance there? Yeah. Now, a spiritual director is a person that can help you work through are you listening to the authentic voice of God or is it your imagination can give you some guidance in prayer, can maybe be your confessor regularly to help you kind of journey without kind of just floundering around in circles, you know. And I think that even in the absence of a good Holy Spiritual director, if we authentically seek God's will, God will be our, our spiritual director, if you will. And I think that's what happened to me is that God was directing me along that path. If you can close us in prayer. Of course. In the name of the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit, amen. Heavenly Father, we thank you for the gift of life and the gift of our vocations. May we know your call, may we follow your call, and may your call lead us to joy in this life and beatitude in eternity with you and the saints in heaven forever. And we make these prayers through Christ our Lord. Amen. Amen. Amen.